all the praise, God. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that you rose from the grave. You conquered hell, death, and the grave, God. We praise you tonight, Jesus. We thank you, Lord.
Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. You're worthy of all of our praise, God. You're worthy of all of the glory, God, and all the honor, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you in this place, oh God.
tonight. Praise Him like we mean it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. God. Praise God. Colossians says he is the firstborn of every created thing. Now that doesn't mean the first one born because he wasn't born. He always was. He was the firstborn of every created thing for by him were the all things created. Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, the all things were created by him and for him. He is before the all things, and in him the all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, the firstborn from the dead, where it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. He is the preeminent one, is what the word of God is saying today. John chapter 1 says all things came into existence through him and apart from him there came into existence not one thing which has come into existence and he became flesh and pitched his tent among us. If you need a physical healing step out tonight we'll lay hands on you. Again it doesn't matter how many times you've been prayed for Jesus himself said keep on asking keep on seeking keep on knocking you're not bothering God if you keep coming till he does something. So just come expecting believing God. If you need a physical healing if you need some other kind of a miracle, join those that are down here. If you need a real miracle quickly, real miracle quickly, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And I'd like several men to gather around our brother here and some of the ladies too. The situation is uh, his family is in the Philippines and they're trying to get their children here. And they've been waiting two years and there's a chance it'll be all done tomorrow. So I'd like a whole bunch of you to come and lay hands on him that God will work this miracle today. Praise God. As many as would, come lay hands on these folks that are down here. Come on, you don't heal them anyway. The Bible says these signs will follow them to believe. It doesn't matter if this is your church home or not. If you believe, feel free to come and pray for people. Matter of fact, we want you to come and pray for people. We believe in body ministry here. We're all members of the family of God, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Family of God cares for one another. Praise God. Oh, mighty Lord Jesus. Praise God. Oh, Christian, mighty God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise your mighty name. Praise your mighty name. Praise your mighty name. We need some more folks over here. God bless you. I want each one of you to pray now like you're the only one praying. Let's lift our voices up and pray. Father, we come into your presence rejoicing tonight. Thankful that you're a God that hears and answers prayer. You're the God that created all things, for by you they were and are created. You hold all things up by the word of your own power. You are our creator. You are our God. You are our Father. We ask you tonight in behalf of your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name, we pray for your healing power right now. Pray that you'll flow across this congregation of your people. We lay hands on one another according to your word, and we stand on your promise tonight. We don't ask because we deserve. We ask because of your amazing grace, the grace that sent your son to pay the bill for our sin, the grace that says by his strife we've been healed, the grace that you all things come by your amazing grace to us. Oh, God, touch tonight, we pray, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for other needs represented here. For those that are walking through deep waters, help them to know that you are with him. You said though we walk through the valley of the deepest darkness, we didn't have to fear the evil one because you'd be there with us. Give your strength tonight, your encouragement, and your presence in a very special way. Almighty God, we stand on your word tonight. We pray for the services on the Lord's day. We pray for the mighty move of the Holy Spirit. The many will come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. The people will be filled with the Holy Spirit. The many will be healed and bring testimony of glory to your name. Father, we pray for my brother's family tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we stand in agreement with him. Almighty God, you want this whole family to be here together. And we stand on your word. Oh God, perform your miracles, we pray. Let everything go smoothly. Almighty oh, Lord Jesus. Father, lay individuals on our hearts that don't go to church anywhere. Lay individuals on our hearts that don't know Jesus Christ. And use us to invite them and anoint your people as they invite others to come. But we know you're not willing that one soul should perish. Father, we pray for every ministry of the church. We pray for all the services going on on both sides of the street. 
afraid that each of us will live different than we were when they came in the door. And Father, we pray for the young people that you've kept this week. We pray for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit there, that you'll call some of them into the ministry, that you'll all come back with a fresh anointing, a fresh power of the Holy Spirit, and we'll be careful to give you all tonight praise God God that's for you and Randy well, God is good all the time. Amen. Did we have any first-time guests here tonight? Just slip your hand up. Let's give these folks a good Sheffield welcome tonight. Glad to have you here. And the media department has a short video they want to show. So if you need a debit envelope while the ushers are passing these out, just slip your hand up. And we'll go ahead and let the media department show the short video they have. Wednesday, midweek service. for all ages. Youth Ministry. Worship and Bible Teaching. Wednesday at 7 p.m. Woo, that's good. <laughs> I didn't know they were going to do that. Good to have Randy and Elizabeth back. You've been in Wisconsin, Chicago, where else ministering? Iowa. 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 We got invited to see Jeff Rowe in Stark, Florida next month. Praise God. Praise God. Uh, if you're not aware, they hold prison revivals. And, uh, and inmates get saved, baptized with the Holy Spirit. They go all over the country. Uh, they're even authorized to go into maximum security prisons and even death row. And God has been blessing their ministry down through the years. Of course, they've been in this church forever. Uh, and I got here about the time Noah built the ark, and they came shortly after. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> you were waiting for me, Randy says. But God is really blessing their ministry, so remember them in prayer. 
Uh, this last one in Wisconsin, the, I understand even the warden attended. Well, why? Well, maximum security in Wisconsin had opened the door for them. And uh, uh, the prisoners even wanted to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So a whole bunch of them were baptized in the Holy Spirit. So, you know, God is blessing them. They just travel all the time. And so remember them in prayer. And Randy led worship service a week before they went. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Uh, Sunday, I forgot that so many times we ministered in the churches, and I can't remember when they have the name of the church, like just the community. And I forgot that we were in a Baptist church. And I started talking about being baptized with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> And people were lining up, and one lady almost got slain in the spirit right on the spot. She goes, What is going on? And I said, Well, that's the Holy Spirit. Praise and God. Bless you. So Randy said he was feeling really nervous while he was there. She was <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I, last time I was in Singapore, I preached in the oldest Methodist church in Singapore, and it's more Pentecostal than most Pentecostal churches. You talk about manifestations of the Spirit. The Spirit of God came down. People were saved. Messages and in tongues, interpretation, prophecies. And, uh, you know, God is moving in this day all over the world in spite of all the... Uh, uh, you know, I'm aware as we read Scripture, we're close. Uh, this age is about closing out. How many believe that? Things that we talked about 50 years ago are taking place on the front page of your papers. The one world government is shaping up. Anti-Christian sentiment is shaping up, especially in the American media. Uh, they, uh, they don't want to offend Muslims or atheists, but they don't mind offending Christians. Uh, and so we need to pray. And, but God's in control. God's in control. He knows what's going on. So he, uh, it was even Nebuchadnezzar had to, had to learn that. The ruler of the Babylonian Empire, if you read Daniel, that God still rules in the affairs of men. So God, the you know, neat thing is nothing takes God by surprise. Nothing takes God by surprise. He knew it way ahead of time. He has foreknowledge. He knows what's going on. He knows the end from the beginning. He all knew all of you would be here tonight. He knew exactly what was going on. He knew and he knows all about you and loves you anyway. That's a nice thing. He knows everything about me and loves me anyway. And uh, do you ever look in the mirror and think, I wouldn't love that person very much if I was God? And that's part of the problem with some Christians. We know so much about ourselves. If we were God, we wouldn't answer our prayers. But God does anyway. Because Jesus paid the bill on the cross of Calvary. So whatever we need. But I... Let's see. Uh, did everybody get a handout uh, on Hebrews? If you weren't here the other weeks, this is not a new one. It's a four-page one with a picture of the temple on, actually the tabernacle. Uh, we're talking about 1450 B.C. The exodus took place probably about 1447 B.C. And that's when, that's, when, that's when Moses was commanded to build this big tent, about two-thirds the size of a football field, and to have the Holy of Holies and the holy place and the instruments that we've talked about the last couple of weeks there. I don't have any special announcements except to mention the services, 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock Sunday. And let me encourage you to be faithful and be here. And uh, where, do, where are we supposed to put our tithe? In the storehouse, in your home church. And I mentioned that this past Sunday was my last Sunday at Grandview. I've been filling in for six months. They finally have a pastor. And I've been filling in there. And I reminded them when I did television for 24 years, people would call and say, we don't like what's going on at our church. Should we send you our tithe? I'd say, no, your tithe goes where you go to church. And bring it into the storehouse. That has never changed. And these televangelists who try to tell you tithing is under the law, it was in existence 400 years before the law was ever given, and the law did not do away with it. That first tenth belongs to God. That's my, not mine to decide what to do with. I pray about offerings according to 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And that's where it says God loves a cheerful giver. He doesn't, say, he doesn't say anything about giving the tithe cheerfully. He just says give it and God will give back. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over it. And if everyone tithes and offerings, no church in America would have any problems financially. And we don't have the money suburban churches have. And I've mentioned this before. We have an independent auditor come in every year and audit our books. It's a company that does church books because we want everything to be above board. And the auditor that was here this year had never done our church before. And he told me, he said, George, I've done a lot of churches your size. Everyone has a few families that give a whole bunch of money. He said, you don't have one. 
we, we depend on each person doing their part here at Sheffield Family Life Center. Now, if anyone here tonight has a few million like to drop, we'll be happy to take it. <laughs> but uh, we, you know, we still owe $11 million on this building, but you're sitting in America. We had no money when it started. We were full across the street. We had no money nine years ago. This building cost 21 million, it'd be 45 million today. So you're sitting in a miracle. God is a miracle working God, folks. He really is, he's a miracle working God. And he provides. We have missionaries all over the world we help support. And we have a lot of ministries going on. We feed the homeless, a lot of other things, street ministries and various things taking place. All the ministries that happen here. Our purpose is to reach as many people in as many ways possible. And like we advertised on television for 20 years, we're not a social club, we're a hospital for hurting people. So we don't care about your background, we're not concerned where you're coming from, we're concerned about where you're going. And where we're going is determined by what we do with Jesus Christ. The Bible says, he that has the Son has, and he that doesn't have the Son doesn't have life. Father, we're thankful again tonight, the opportunity of being involved in the greatest work in time or eternity. We offer you these gifts out of hearts and love for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Give back to your people according to your word, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and add the true spiritual riches as Jesus himself taught in Luke 16. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, Amen. 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 We are in the ninth chapter of Hebrews. We've been going kind of slow. And uh, I know some of you thought it was too fast, so I slowed down a bit. Uh, the last time I taught across the street, it took me two years to go through Hebrews, but I, I, we try not to do that anymore. And I do have a college course on it. I was asked to teach it at master's level in Singapore here, and I never got to make the trip because my wife ended up in the hospital, and I had to cancel that trip. I got all kinds of notes that I can't use here, but uh, it's an exciting book, exciting book, because uh, we don't know who the author is. Uh, we, the only thing we know, it wasn't the Apostle Paul. And who do I think might have written it? Priscilla. Priscilla. That's why I believe that's possibly why there's no name on it. And when Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned as teachers, she is usually mentioned first, meaning she was the strongest teacher of the two. And it's obviously, a, it's obviously the Apostle Paul's theology. He's writing to Jewish Christians to remind them they are no longer under the Sinai Covenant. That the Sinai Covenant was broken by the people. God established the Sinai Covenant in Exodus chapter 19 to 24. He said, I brought you out of Egypt on eagles' wings. I've delivered you. Then he gave the covenant so they would know how to live. He said, if you keep this covenant, you will be my particular people. And the people in Exodus 24 said, all the Lord has said, we will do. Did they do it? They broke the covenant. Isaiah reminds them they broke the covenant. The book of Hebrews reminds them they broke the covenant. And for a rather homely illustration, if Randy and I make a covenant and I break it, it's no longer good. And that's what happened to all the things of that covenant. They broke it. It is no longer an existing covenant because it was broken by one of the two parties. The new covenant, again, is made between God the Father and God the Son. God the Father on God's side, God the Son on our side, and neither party can fail, neither party will break the covenant. So as long as we're abiding in Jesus Christ, we're part of an unbreakable covenant that was made on the cross of Calvary. He's able to keep us if we're willing to be kept. And the book of Hebrews gives us five warnings. We still have a free will. You can walk away if you want to. Now, why would anyone want to? Well, why did Judas betray Jesus? Well, why did, why did people walk away? Why did Paul say, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, when he, lifted his, when he listed him as a fellow laborer? We still have a free will. He doesn't make us robots after we're saved. He's, Paul says he's able to keep that that I've committed to him against that day. But these warnings are real. Okay, they're not artificial. God doesn't put things in his book to waste words. I read a book on Hebrews several years ago, and the author said, these things are in the Bible in case this could happen, but it can't happen. Well, why did God put it in the Bible if it can't happen? He warns us. And, and actually, the textbook I use at master's level with my students is written by F.F. F. Bruce, uh, who, uh, who is from England. He's one of the top scholars of our day. And he makes a statement. Uh, uh, and he makes it in spite of his theology that these are literal warnings and putting down as actual experiences in the book of Hebrews. And as is Colossians, uh, he will present us holy and unblameable, and I translate it unnitpickable in his sight, if we continue in the faith grounded and, fettled, grounded and, grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. And I remind you in Hebrews chapter 2, he calls us holy brothers, share the heavenly calling. 
And he says, beware lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and apostatizing from the living God. He's not writing to non-Christians. He's writing to those he calls sharers of the heavenly calling. In chapter 6, it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made sharers of the Holy Spirit and... Uh, I lost the next phrase, and tasted the word of God good, and the, and the powers of the world to come good, and fell away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they keep on crucifying the Son of God afresh, and keep on putting him to an open shame. And this is written as an actual experience that has happened to people. But God is able to keep us. The New Testament emphasized God's able to keep us. How many know he's able to keep you today? By his amazing power. Okay? So we're in chapter 9. We talked... And I'm just going to read the first verses. You have the map of the tabernacle in your hand, and we talked about it at length last week. Uh, he says, the first covenant also had ordinances of divine service and, an, and a worldly sanctuary. He uses the word cosmos, which talks about the structured society. Okay. And there was a tabernacle, which was a tent. And the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is the holiest of all, that had the golden censer. Now, the golden censer went into the Holy of Holies only on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And that's when the high priest would carry the golden censer into the Holy of Holies. And we talked about it in the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, describes the Day of Atonement. Had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna. It also had Aaron's rod that budded, the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubim of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly, so he's dropping the issue. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. That means they lit the candle, and they changed the showbread, and they offered incense, representing praise. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and with the ignorances of the people. The Holy Spirit thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet revealed while the first tabernacle was yet standing. Which is, and your King James says a figure, the Greek word is parabolain. What does that sound like? Parable. The Greek word for parable. He's saying the Old Testament system of worship, the whole tabernacle was a parable of New Testament truth. It's only temporary. It was a parable for the time then present in which were offered gifts and sacrifices that could not make him, did the serf, him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Now one thing he shows here, people brought their sacrifices and God indicated, yes, you're forgiven for your sin, but he couldn't set them free from the bondage of sin. Okay, the sacrifices couldn't do that. The sacrifices could not cleanse their conscience. They still felt guilt. Look what I've done. Look how I failed God. Look why I had to bring a sacrifice. It could not change the conscience. Aren't you glad for the blood of Jesus Christ that changes our conscience? And if the, if the enemy keeps reminding you of your past sin, I've got news for you. It's not God. God cannot remember sin that's under the blood of Jesus Christ. The only one that remembers it are you and your friends and the devil. And the devil's good at reminding you of it and so are your friends. But God has forgotten it. He will never bring it up to you again. He, he is totally gone. Don't let the enemy keep you under condemnation. That's why Paul says in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus for what the law couldn't do was weak through the flesh. The law said don't but gave me no power to quit. The law said do this but gave me no power to do it. Look, the law couldn't do it that was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of flesh of sin and in behalf of sin judged against sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law not the letter of the law, the moral principles of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We live by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus today. If you all still here? Say amen. amen. All right, let's read it. No one else could go into the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could walk in. Now, he's going to talk the next three chapters about going in. All right, 9, 10, and 11. About going into the Holy of Holies, which was a parable for the time then present in which were offered gifts and sacrifices that could not make him the perfect, perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meat and drink and various washings and carnal ordinances imposed upon them until the time of reformation. The word translated reformation means setting things right. In other words, the tabernacle, the whole Old Testament system of worship was temporary. 
And we've gone all through the various passages that teach that. We all went, uh, we went through the book of Galatians, chapter 3 and 4. Seven arguments that show we are not under the Sinai covenant. We went through 2 Corinthians 2 or 3 that shows we're not under the Sinai covenant. We went through Colossians 1 that says Jesus took that certificate of indebtedness out of the way and he nailed it to his cross. Let no man judge you in meat or drink or respect of a holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath. There's only a shadow of things to come but the bodies of Christ. That law that said you're guilty, 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 guilty. He took it out of the way and nailed it to his cross. And that's why there's no condemnation to them during Christ Jesus today. So we are not under that covenant. And the enemy is all, and Christians are always trying to get people back under that covenant. They're always trying to get you back under that. And the Bible makes it clear we're not under that. There's, there are people around today that are trying to make the church Jewish. The church is not Jewish. The church is not Old Testament. The church is New Testament. And you read the book of Acts, there were more Gentiles in it than there were Jews. There were more. And so uh, that's why Paul rebukes the Galatians. Uh, I mentioned before, he calls them Galatian dummies. It's the same word Socrates used to call a student stupid. He said, you were saved by grace. What makes you think you're saved by keeping law now? You were saved by pure grace. So we're not under the Sinai covenant. Whoops, my page is turned. Okay. Now, but Christ have come a high priest. The word means to be come alongside of. He became a high priest of good things to come. Now, don't underestimate the word good. Good. Because the... Uh, I mean, you read the Old Testament in the, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the promised land was called a good land. Okay, so don't underestimate the word good here. He became a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, tent, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood. He entered in, and the Greek word epipox means once for all. Say that with me. Once for all. It never, 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 never has to be done again. And this is my contention with the Roman Catholic Mass. Every time the priest elevates the wafer, he is re-sacrificing the blood of Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ. It has to be done over and over and over and over and over again. I think I may have mentioned last week, I had a priest friend in New Iberia, Louisiana, who he, uh, he started reading the book of Hebrews. And when he read the book of Hebrews, he put out in his church paper, the, uh, come Sunday, the pastor will no longer offer mass, he will preach on Sundays. Now, he didn't last very long, but he knew he couldn't do that mass again because Jesus did it once for all on the cross of Calvary. All right? So you can't add to it. Imposed on them. He become a high priest of good things to come by a greater, more perfect tabernacle. Now, what is it? His own body. His own body. Again, I remind you of John chapter 1. Literally. And John's mind goes back to that tent of meeting in the desert where the Shekinah glory of God would come down as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And everyone could stand in their tent door and look in that tent door and see the glory of God. And John literally says this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things came into existence through him, and apart from him there came into existence not one thing which has come into existence. And he goes on to the 14th verse and says, literally, the Word became flesh and pitched his tent in our midst. And we saw his glory. The glory is of the unique one of the Father, full of grace and truth. That means, what a, that means I can stand in my tent door and look in Jesus' tent door, and I can tell what God is like. He could say, he that has seen me has seen the Father. You want to know who God is? Look at Jesus, his character, his nature, his power, his everything. We look at Jesus Christ and see it. So that's what he's saying here. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once for all. And if you want the Greek word, it's epipax. Let me spell it for you. E-P-H-A-P-O-X. E-P-H-A-P-O-X. Epipax. E-P-H-A-P-O-X having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkles the unclean, sanctifies the, sanctifies the puring of the flesh. Now, how many have heard of the red heifer? The ashes of the red heifer. Evangelists were saying all over the country for years, well, they can't rebuild the temple till they find the ashes of a red heifer. 
They are breeding red heifers. Okay, they started out in, it was either Arkansas, Louisiana, breeding red heifers. They are currently being bred in Israel. Now, what does red heifer has to do with it? Go to Numbers chapter 19. Numbers chapter 19. You all still here? All right, anytime you want a question, just raise your hand up and scream, and someone will bring you a microphone. All right. Okay, Numbers chapter 19. Now, this is talking about ceremonial uncleanness. Ceremonial uncleanness. Starting with verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, unto Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law, which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring you a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came the yoke. And you shall give her under Eliezer the priest, and he may bring her forth without the camp, and one shall kill her before his face. And Eliezer the priest shall take of her blood and his finger, and sprinkle of the blood directly before the tabernacle of the congregation seven times. And one shall burn the heifer in his sight, her skin, her flesh, her blood, and her dung that he burned. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast it in the midst of the burning of the heifer. And the priest shall wash his clothes and he shall... <laughs> I'm sorry, he shall bathe his flesh in water. And afterward he shall come into the camp and the priest shall be unclean until the evening. And he that burns her shall wash the clothes in water and has his flesh in water. He shall be unclean until the evening." And a man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and lay them up without the camp in a clean place. And it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for a water of separation it is a purification for sin. He that gathered the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes, be unclean till the evening. It shall be unto the children of Israel and the stranger that sojourns among them for the statue forever. Now he's talking, if you go on to read the rest of the chapter, if you touch a dead body, you're unclean. If you touch an unclean thing, you are unclean. So it's talking about ceremonial cleanness. But it's also used as a picture of sin. So they have to have the ashes of the red heifer. Now there's no commandment on the day of atonement for the high priest to use the ashes of the red heifer. And it's actually mixed with water and all those various other things. We'll talk about that later. But the ash, uh, there isn't any commandment. But Jewish tradition says that the high priest would use it twice in the seven days before Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. And that was the day he'd go into the Holy of Holies and offer the sacrifice for the sin of the nation. And he would isolate himself for seven days in the temple. That's biblical. But it... Uh, we're actually told that twice during that time they would come in and they would bring the ashes of the red heifer so he could purify himself twice during the seven days. So, so the author of the book of Hebrews is drawing on both things. He's drawing on the Old Testament law and also what was going on actually with the bringing of the red heifer. So the red heifer is being produced. They have to have that. And they were saying they can't have a day of atonement without the red heifer. But God is providing it. Uh, those of you that haven't been here, the Jews have everything they need to rebuild their temple. Right now, the Mosque of Omar sits there, the Dome of the Rock, the second most important, uh, that's the second most important Muslim shrine in the whole world. The strict Hasidim, that's the Jews that stand at the Wailing Wall and go like this and have the long beards and the funny hats, okay? They are waiting for their Messiah to come and tear down the Dome of the Rock so they can rebuild their temple. And they have everything ready. And I have seen most of the things, the high priest garment, the labor, the, uh, and also the vessels for carrying the blood away. And many of you know, I asked one of the two leading rabbis in Jerusalem, if you're going to make a replica of the ark. And he told me years ago, we don't have to, we have the original. They do have the ark of the covenant. And by the way, it wasn't in Ethiopia. Okay, how many have heard on television that the ark was in Ethiopia? Have you heard that? The ark was in Ethiopia. Uh, and then there's some evangelists saying, well, he found it underneath the temple. Uh, under, he didn't find it. All right. And he said, well, it had to be underneath Calvary so the blood would drip on. The blood didn't have to drip on the ark. Okay. The ark was a symbol of what Jesus Christ was going to do. But they have the ark of the covenant. It has never, never, never been in Ethiopia. Now, listen to the story. Okay. This is what was told. Well, the queen of Sheba wanted a copy of the ark. So Solomon had a copy of the ark made, and he got them mixed up. And they sent the real one with her back to Ethiopia. Number one, who could go in the Holy of Holies to make a copy of the ark? Nobody. They'd die on the spot. The high priest could only go in once a year. You see, but they pull a verse of Scripture, totally of context, and make it say what they want it to say. We don't read into Scripture. We read out of Scripture. 
It's like I told you, uh, 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 there's a doctor friend of mine in Texas, and he called me one day and said, George, they're teaching on television that the Nephilim, the giants, uh, in Genesis 6 and also in, in the book of Numbers are aliens. And they got this real complex system worked out. And I just told them what the scripture said. They're not aliens. There are no aliens in scripture, folks. There are no aliens. There is God the Son. He's the only alien there, and he became one of us. So he's not an alien. There are no aliens in scripture. But people read into scripture what they want to read into it. We have to let scripture speak to us. Okay, speak out of it. So if the blood of goats, bulls and of goats. Now the Jews stopped using the ashes of a heifer, I guess in 70 A.D., I need the mic here, okay? And you have to talk loud. I just, I just had a question. Oh, oh about, the mic's not on. I just had a question about what you mentioned in Genesis 6. Uh-huh. Okay, Genesis 6. You want to know about Genesis 6? The sons of God saw the daughters of men, but they were fair. And they took them wives of all that they chose. And there were giants in the land in those days, okay? They became men of renown. Okay, Genesis chapter 6. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. Now what you hear, and what you hear is an interpretation from the apocryphal book of Enoch. You do not interpret the Bible by apocryphal books. What I mean by apocryphal is phony Bible books. The book of Enoch was written in the 4th century A.D. Okay, the, the book of Enoch was written in the 4th century A.D. And there are people that interpret Genesis chapter 6 by the apocryphal book of Enoch. Now, in the first place, we don't have a book from Enoch. That was way before the flood. The sons of God are not fallen angels. All right? Let me ask a question. If they were fallen angels, could they be called sons of God? No. no. Secondly, the only place angels are called sons of God is in Job, which is poetry. And it just says, when creation was made, the sons of God shouted for joy. Angels are never called sons of God any other place but poetry. Now, the Hebrew text says this, they took them wives. You recall what the Sadducees came to Jesus and said, now Jesus, there was a man that had six brothers. And he married a woman and he died. And the second one married her. He died. And the third one married her till all seven had her. Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? What did Jesus say? They'll be like the angels, which neither marry nor are given in marriage. They'll be like the angels in heaven. The, it actually says here they took them wives. They married them. Secondly, angels are spirits. They cannot reproduce. They only appear as men sometimes. But they are not men. They are angels. They are spirits. The Bible calls them ministering spirits in Hebrews chapter 2. They are ministering spirits. Hebrews chapter 1, rather, ministering spirits. They cannot reproduce. Context determines the meaning of the word. Context determines everything. Again, a text without a context is a pretext. You have to leave it in the sentence it's in, in the book it's in, in the paragraph it's in. Now, he says, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them, let me finish this first, they took them wives of all that they chose. The earliest rabbinical tradition is accurate. In that context, the sons of God are the godly line of Seth. The daughters of men are the ungodly line of Cain. All the descendants of Cain died in the flood. And it says the same became men of renown. The Hebrew idiom for men of renown is men of a name, meaning men who have made a name for themselves, men of renown. There in that case, in Genesis 6, it says men of the name. What is the name in the Old Testament? God's name, YHWH. They became men of the name. Such a one was Noah, who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He is the spiritual Nephilim of that day. Leave it in context. Don't pull it out. So angels cannot reproduce. There was a teaching going around Kansas City years ago that, Eve was the, that Cain was the product of Satan and Eve. The Bible clearly says Adam had sex with his wife and she conceived and bare Cain. What are you going to do? Throw it away? Well, the book of Jude said he was the evil one. He certainly was. The evil one inspired him. But the Bible says he was produced by Adam and his wife. When the obvious sense makes the best sense, any other sense is nonsense. Just read what it says. All kinds of teaching and doctrine comes up because scriptures are pulled out of context and ignored. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so here's my question. Hold on. Let me get first. Sorry if I hate you, sir. 
Okay, so we say, and I believe, that our past is our past. But here's the problem. When you mess up with a job, or you mess up with your child and you lose your child because you did something horrifying, people of the world judge you for that. If you mess up on one too many jobs, people won't hire you. If you have no experience, you don't get hired. Right. So It's tough right now. Exactly. And I'm a <laughs> proven fact, unfortunately, I had a, been out of work for over a year and um, had an interview with Red Lobster and I fell and popped my kneecap out of place. Now to go to see an optic surgeon, or, or not an optic surgeon, not, um, whatever, the bone doctor. Uh -huh. And I have three little girls. And so. Well, you know, that happens and it's difficult. I know my own daughter was out of work for two years. That's what happens, especially as you get older. It's hard to get a job. But let's pray for our sister right now. Father, in Jesus' name, you're a miracle working God. And you open doors where no doors seem to be open. So I pray you'll surround her with your love and let her know that you love her as if she's the only one you ever had to love. And you're the God that's able to take care and the God that's provide. So we ask for your miracles in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. 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 Okay, any other questions on Genesis 6 here? We had, okay. Oh, Pastor. Yes. You know, I want to go back to the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, Solomon was wise enough, would you say, to build a replica? Yeah, yeah, you, you couldn't, couldn't. You don't, you don't think he was wise enough? To no, 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 nobody was. Hmm. Nobody was. Nope. Okay. Nope. It's a, there's one verse of scripture about the Ethiopians pulled out of context, and Isaiah's got nothing to do with that. And it's pulled out and used. Again, the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door and they spout all kinds of scripture and everyone's pulled out of context. Because Taz Russell decided what he wanted to believe and pulled scripture out of context to prove it. And let me explain, those of you that may not have heard me explain context. Okay? Uh, suppose you're walking through a forest and the guy's got a power saw and he says, I want to find a big trunk. What's he talking about? A tree trunk. Suppose someone's walking through a zoo and saying, I want to see a big trunk. What's he talking about? An elephant, An elephant trunk. Supposing someone's taking a trip overseas and said, I need a big trunk. What's he talking about? A big suitcase. Context determines the meaning of the word. The Bible is the same way. The word flesh has five different uses in the New Testament. The words around it explain what it means. So we have to leave the, 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 the verse in the... We have to leave it in the sentence it's in, in the paragraph it's in, in the book it's in, in order to understand what he's talking about. Okay, we need a mic down here, please. Okay. That's good. good. I like discussion. Back to uh, Genesis 6. And hold the mic close. Back to Genesis 6. Uh -huh. Okay. When I heard the gentleman on TV discussing what you were talking about, uh -huh. he also mentioned DNA that the DNA is altered, was altered. But there's no such teaching. Right, he's, exactly. Yeah, he's reading and that into it. I was thinking, what my point is, I was thinking about people that were hearing that that didn't know, that didn't know the difference, how many people could have been deceived. Oh, they could have, and they're selling all kinds of books. Exactly. Christians are gullible. They want to believe so much. That's why we need to be anchored in the Word. That's why we need to know, that's why we need to hide this Word in our heart, read it, and when someone comes with a false teaching, the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance scriptures that tell the truth if you've taken time to prepare it. That's why two parts of the armor of God in Ephesians 6 have to do with the Word of God. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Okay, so you can stand. And then also the one offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit. Prove to the Son of God. Throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. It is written, you shall not test the Lord your God. Okay, uh, 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 turn these stones into bread. It is written, he, he, a man shall not live by bread alone. He took the offense with the sword with the word of God. So it's offensive and defensive. We have to know the word. Spend time hiding it in your heart. It's always fresh. It's always fresh. Read it. And if you want a good study Bible, the New American Standard is still the most accurate English translation available. The New American Standard. So, all right, let's go on here in Hebrews. Any other questions here before we go on in Hebrews? All right. If the blood of bulls of goats, the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ? Now, 
The Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So when it says the blood, Jesus is pouring out his sinless life for our sinful lives. He's pouring out his whole life on the cross of Calvary. All right, pouring it out. Who through the... And now the King James says the eternal spirit. There is no the in the Greek text. Through an eternal spirit. Now, uh, a lot of times you read about the spirit in the New Testament. I like the way Gordon Fee, he's probably the number one Bible scholar in the world today. Uh, he writes spirit many times in the in New Testament this way. He puts a big S and then a small spirit. It's the Holy Spirit working through my spirit. The Holy Spirit working through your spirit that enables us to live for God. So when Jesus offered himself through an eternal spirit, I remind you, he is God the Son. He was never separated from the Father or the Holy Spirit, except when he cried on the cross, Ali, Ali, Lama Savakthani, in the Aramaic tongue, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was prophesied in the 32nd Psalm that he would say that, because the wages of sin is what? Death. death. And that was primarily, first of all, spiritual death. God told Adam and Eve, in the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're going to die. They didn't die physically that day. They died spiritually, separated from God. Ephesians 2, you have been made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. In times past, you walked according to the age of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now effectively energizes the sons of disobedience among whom we all had our matter of living in times past, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we're by nature, that means by matter of practice, the children of wrath, even as others. That's Ephesians chapter 1. But God, who is rich in mercy with his great love when he loved, with, with he loved us, has made us alive together in Christ. And so the Holy Spirit enables us to live for God. Now God the Son was separated from the Father on the cross of Calvary. Why? He had to pay the full bill for our sin. That included spiritual death. The only time in all of eternity the Father was separated from the Son. I've had people say, well, how can the Father be separated from the Son? How could the Son become a man? How could God speak and create a billion times a billion words? I don't know, but he did it. He did it. I know the night they asked me when I got saved, I didn't know the terminology. I was 19 years old. And they said, we want the young man to give a testimony. I said, what's that? They said, what's God done for you? I said, I don't know, but something happened. <laughs> I didn't have the terminology, didn't know the words, but he changed my life. And so offered himself to the spot to purge your conscience from dead works. To serve. Now, what does he mean by dead works? If you have an NIV, don't forget, the NIV is not a translation. It's a dynamic equivalent. They put it in their own words. It's not a word-for-word -word translation. Now, that's why I recommend the New American Standard. It's a word-for-word -word translation. And they translate the dead works as the way you lived before you met Jesus Christ. Well, in the context of Hebrews, the dead works are trying to be saved by keeping law trying to be saved by doing the rituals and the ceremonies and the feast days and the sacrifices and all the things that took place under the law, not eating pork, not wearing mixed material, okay, having a fence around your roof and all, all those kind of things. And when you get to the 13th chapter of the book of Hebrews, he says those that are occupied with these things, it's no good. <laughs> no good. He'll, he, uh, he'll say that in the last chapter. That's the dead works. Uh, Paul says uh, in the book of Romans 9, 10, and 11, I was actually talking about the fact that God has future plans for Israel. He's not done with Israel. He's still going to work with them, chapter 9, 10, and 11. But you notice what he says in, uh, in chapter 10 of Romans. He says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For the, I bear them record they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And he uses epinosis, which is personal intimate relationship knowledge of God, not head knowledge. Okay, that's the Greek word gnosis. This is epinosis. In the New Testament, there is no such thing as false epinosis. It means you know God. Okay, they have a zeal of God, but not according to epinosis, experimental knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, that's the righteousness that's acceptable to God, and the righteousness that God puts down to our account when we receive Jesus Christ. Going about to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. He is the one the law pointed to, and the law is over, through, finished, done, abolished. 
that they could be declared righteous by God by bringing a sacrifice in obedience, even though they did not know that sin was going to be put on Jesus years later. But he is the end of the law for righteousness. So if you want to be righteous before God, you need the best transfer, the best trade in the history of the world. I was reading Rod Parsley's new book on the cross today. I'm on the board of the college up at Rod Parsley. And uh, he wrote in a book called The Cross. And he makes a statement that way back in the 20s, he said the Boston Red Sox were the number one team and the Yankees were way down at the bottom. And they made a trade. The Red Sox got rid of one guy they didn't think was going to be very good. That guy's name was Babe Ruth. They did not win another championship for 65 years after they got rid of Babe Ruth. He was talking about trades, and then he's going on to say the best trade ever made was on the cross of Calvary when Jesus took our sin and he puts his righteousness down to our account. Praise God. You're never going to get a better trade than that. Okay. Yeah, the only other trade I really like beside that is, the, as Isaiah says, they that wait on the Lord, literally the Hebrew text says they will exchange their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. When I wait on God, I give him my strength. He gives me his. That's the best trade you're ever going to make there, too. Now, from dead works, that's the law, to serve the living God. For this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant. Now, uh, the Greek word for covenant is, uh, is actually a diatheke. Okay, diatheke. And I use Greek because I taught it for 25 years. All right, diatheke. It's the word used for covenant. But it gives a new meaning to it here in this chapter. A brand new meaning to the term covenant. Now, we've already talked about the covenant made between Randy and I. Oh, that's a covenant. Both sides have to keep their part. The new ones between the Father and the Son. Now he says this. He is the mediator of the new covenant that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, I told you before, he died for the sin of the whole world, all the way from Adam to the last person, even though they didn't understand it. They which are called might receive the promise of inheritance. For where a testament is, there must have, ne there must have necessity be the, the death of the testament, testator. He adds the word will here. The book of Hebrews is the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. You leave a will, it's no good till you're dead. And then the stuff is divided according to the will. So he takes the word diatheke, which is covenant, and adds the idea of a will to it here. All right, let's read it. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of et eternal inheritance. How do you get an inheritance from your family? Through a will. Now, if you're smart, you won't use a will. You use a living trust, okay? Because a will has to go through probate. I'm just throwing that out here. If you get a living trust, it doesn't have to go through probate court. I have all my insurance policies going into a living trust, not into a will. Of eternal inheritance. Where a will is, there must of necessity be the death of the will maker. A will is in force after men are dead. Otherwise, it's of no strength at all while the person lives. Wherefore... Now he goes back from the will to the Sinai covenant. Okay, he, uh, he drops it here. He just throws it in. Now, a will, for the first place, there has to be some errors for it to be any good. The Bible says we have an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, the phase not away, reserved in heaven for us, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, Second Peter. He goes on to say, but now be, if need be, you are in heaviness through multiple testings, that the testing of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, might be found unto praise and glory and honor at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So there is an inheritance. You are all quadrillionaires tonight, if you believe in Jesus Christ. Now, you're not getting any of it here, okay? It's going to be on the other side. But he takes care of us here. He just gives us what we need. You know, the teaching going around, God wants everybody rich. He makes one person rich. He's no respecter of persons. Well, that might be because Randy can play the guitar, then God's a respecter of person because he hadn't taught me to play the guitar. That's the logic of that kind of reasoning. How do you know God has a different plan for every life? He really does. And he doesn't have one gospel for Americans and another gospel for my brothers and sisters in Burma. It's called Myanmar today where the pastors make $15 a month. 
Okay, he doesn't have two gospels. He doesn't have another gospel for my brothers and sisters in Togo, West Africa, where they bring their tithe to the church on the day they make money. And then on Sunday, they dance up the aisle and, and they make another offering of pennies to the Lord. And the average person makes $600 a year. God doesn't have one gospel for America and another gospel for them. It's one gospel. The Bible doesn't say God so loved the Americas. What does it say? God so loved who? The world. That he gave his unique son. The word only begotten means unique, one of a kind. And the French Bible translates it that way, unique. Oh. So, there has to be something to inherit. There has to be somebody to get it. When we receive Jesus Christ, we become children of God and sons of God. Okay, we have a mic down here, please. Oh, you've got to have a mic or people won't hear you. Okay. I just missed something you said. You said the what? Hold the mic close. The what Bible? Translates it? New American Maybe. Standard, the NASB. Okay. That's the most accurate English translation we have. Translates it unique. Uh -huh. In Spanish, it's uh, unico, which is. I wouldn't unique. have any idea about Spanish. It's the same, unique. Yeah, I don't know, no hablo. <laughs> no hablo espanol. <laughs> no entendo espanol either. <laughs> That's the extent of my Spanish, folks. <laughs> All right. Now, so he has to die, which he did, because there has to be some people to inherit. The Bible says we're children of God. That means we are shares of his nature, and we're sons of God. That means we're legal heirs. Okay, we're called both. And then there has to be an approval by the court that this will is accepted. And when Jesus said it is finished, the high court of heaven ripped the veil of the temple in two. And said that now there is access into the presence of God. I had a sermon I preached years ago on Easter called the greatest sermon ever preached. Now that wasn't the greatest sermon, but that's what I was preaching about. The greatest sermon ever preached. The preacher was God the Father. The pulpit was Calvary. And Jesus said, when you've lifted the Son of Man up, my Father will show you who I am. He was the light of the world. It got dark during the crucifixion. The earthquake came and he came out of the grave, the living one, that he alone is the way to God. And the veil of the temple was ripped in two. So his father showed who he was. So it has to be approved by the court of heaven. Now, but now he goes back to Exodus again. Or he, I should say she, she that's Westlake 912. <laughs> okay. Neither was the first testament dedicated without blood. And again, you can read this in Exodus 19 to 24, primarily 24. When Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, that's to make it spreadable, and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled the book and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has enjoined to you. Moreover, as a matter of fact, if you read that passage in Exodus, it's the first time he is called the God of Israel at the end of that covenant in Exodus 19 to 24. First time he's called the God of Israel. Almost moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry. Almost all things by the law are purged with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Now, it was possible for poor people to bring just an ephah, a measure of flour, a bowl of flour, if that's all they had. It was possible. They could bring two young turtle doves if they could not afford an animal sacrifice. You recall when Jesus was dedicated, they brought two turtle doves, according to the law, meaning a very poor family. Now, they weren't poor after the wise men left. They had gold, <laughs> gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know, I've heard some people say, well, Jesus called poor fishermen, Peter and James and John and Andrew. Hey, they owned the fishing business. Read your Bible. It says they owned the fishing business with Zebedee, and they left the hired servants and followed Jesus. How many know poor folks don't have hired servants? All right. They, he wasn't a poor fisherman. That was big business. Big business. He said, Lord, we forsake it all to follow you. What are we going to get out of it? What are we going to get out of it? You know, the King James is so kind. Behold, Lord, we have forsaken all. He's saying, hey, it cost me a bundle to follow you. What's in it for me? Now, that was after the rich young ruler came to Jesus, and he said, good teacher, what good thing can I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, why are you calling me good? There isn't anyone good but God. Meaning what? If you're only recognizing me a man, stop calling me good. 
But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. The young man said which? And Jesus paraphrased the last six of the ten that have to do with our relationship with other people. And the young man said, hey, I've done this all from my youth up. Now, we know he hadn't, but Jesus didn't argue with him. But he said, there's something. He said, what am I lacking? He said, if you're going to be perfect, sell what you have, give to the poor, take up your cross and follow me. That summed up the first four commandments. Have to do with our relationship with God. He went away sorrowful. Why? His money was his God. And he wasn't willing to lay it down. He's the only person he ever told to do that. So if anyone tells you to sell everything and give it to God, make sure it's God, not a televangelist. All right? Now, without the shedding of blood. And actually, soldiers could bring gold. Okay, they could bring gold that they'd taken in, uh, uh, in the battlefield. You can read that in Numbers chapter 31, the various things that poor people could bring. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things should be purified with these, the heaven with better sacrifices than these. Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are only a figure of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. The Bible says he's at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. He's not there as a bleeding, dying lamb. He's there as King of kings and Lord of lords. I remind you, he said in Matthew 28, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. And over here, he says, lo, I am with you always, even till the end of the age. And sandwiched right in the middle is therefore go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the bottom line for the church. I mentioned Sunday when I was preaching my last sermon at Grandview. I've been down there for six months and they finally got a good man for a pastor. But I mentioned that too many Christians are content to be like Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration. Lord, it's good to be here. Let's pitch three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. We'll, we'll just stay up here on the top of this mountain and enjoy the blessing of God. Woo, it's good to be here. Woo, praise the Lord. Woo. I'm more concerned about just getting blessed than going out and reaching the world for Jesus Christ. The bottom line of the church is God wants everybody saved. And that's our commission, and he's never changed it. That's the purpose. And if you know, so, how many know somebody that's not saved? Do something about it. Drag them to church. Take them out for dinner. Whatever. Again, over 90% of all people that are saved anywhere in the world are saved because a friend invites them to church. That's a fact. Yes. Okay, hold the mic. Okay, my question is uh, the use of the blood. Is that where, where it started in the garden with Adam and Eve when blood was first Yes, used blood was to, shed. To, yep. um, to make the, the coats and skins. Well, right, right. To clothe them yeah. after they... Right. I actually heard some liberal theologian say, well, God didn't kill the animals. No, he skinned them alive? Come on. <laughs> That'd be worse. Of course he killed the animals. Animals are made for man, not man for animals. You know, we have the, I'm not getting into policies, we have a bunch of people in the EPA that are educated beyond their intelligence. They're more concerned about a two-inch worm than families that need to survive and make a living. And they've ruined thousands of good, good fertile land in California to preserve a two-inch worm. That's why I say they're educated beyond their intelligence. I better not get into that. Let's get back here. I don't very often do that. I've been here 40 years. I don't very often get off on anything like that. Now, for Christ is not into the holy place which are made with hands, which are the figures or parables of the true, but into heaven itself to appear in the presence of God for us. When you can't pray, remember he's praying for you. And he is king of kings and lord of lords. Not yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then he must often have suffered from the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the ages. The, end, the last age began with Jesus dying on the cross of Calvary. The end of the age. The Jews looked for the end of the age which was the day of the Holy Spirit and the day of the Messiah. And it came when Jesus paid the bill on the cross of Calvary, followed up by Pentecost and the power of Pentecost. He appeared once in the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He gave himself a ransom for us. Now I remind you, the word salvation means to be delivered. And Jesus gave himself a ransom. We've been ransomed. The me primary meaning of that is delivered from slavery. We were slaves of sin. We've been set free. 
We're no longer slaves of sin. That's what Paul says in Romans 6. You used to be the slaves of sin. Now you're the slaves of righteousness. Stop giving into the flesh. Stop doing the things you used to do. How can I stop now? I have the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside. I can say no, and he gives me the power to put it into practice. But I have to say no. He hasn't made me a robot. We still have to make decisions. We have to make choices day by day. That's why, that's why Jeremiah said, I'll put my law in their heart and in their mind. Not this external thing. It's in here. And I don't have to do what it says any more than I have to drive 65 because there's a sign saying drive 65. Okay, how many of you never go over 65? One hand. Okay. I won't say a word about me. <laughs> oh, are you pointing at Paula? <laughs> well, my wife now. You know, when I had both my knees replaced at the same time nine years ago, and my doctor said, I don't want you to take one step without a walker for a month. And uh, he wanted to do one at a time. I said, no way, you're going to do them both at once. So I had them both done, and I walked with that walker for a month. Matter of fact, two weeks later, I preached up here with a walker. And I'm walking around with this walker, and I have to ride with Gene driving. <laughs> now... I honestly thought at the end of a month, I told someone, I'm never going to be able to walk without this thing. I won't be able to do it. So I go back to the doctor. I say, when can I drive? He said, let me see you walk without your walker. So I walked without it. <laughs> I mean, she would go 60 maybe you know, on the freeway. And uh, I won't tell you what I do. Now, it's appointed on the man wants to die. There is no reincarnation. <clears throat> okay? You don't come back as somebody else. That's Eastern religion. If you go out here to Unity Village, it's Buddhism using Christian words. It is not Christian. They say Christ is the divine principle in every human being. That's Buddhism. That is not Christianity. They believe in reincarnation, the cycle of life. That's Buddhism, not Christianity. The point on the man wants to die. How many times does once mean? Once. once. Doesn't mean two, three, four, five, six. It means once. And after death, the judgment. Now, Christians' sin is not going to be judged after you die. Your sin was judged on Calvary. The great white throne judgment is for the ungodly. Read your Bible. The Bible talks in 1 Corinthians about it. And also 2 Corinthians about the judgment seat of Christ. That's for rewards. Your sin was judged at Calvary. I read in 1 John, he's writing to Christians. My little children, I read unused to these things that you don't sin. And the Greek tense means don't commit a single sin. But if you do, we have an advocate with the Father. And he goes on to say, if we're walking in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. That's between us and him. And the blood of Jesus Christ keeps on cleansing us from every sin. It's like you're walking under the shower of the blood of Christ. Now you can walk away from it. The Bible's clear. And we'll see more of that in the next couple of chapters of Hebrews about the practice of willful sin. Just keep it up and keep it up and keep it up. He warns against that later on in Hebrews. But as long as you want to be kept, that blood keeps on cleansing. So when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, he's not going to say, Randy, you got mad at that person and you blew it. He's not going to say that. That's under the blood. He can't see it. He can't remember it. You can go back in the Old Testament. We're going to see this in Hebrews chapter 11. When God came along to Abraham and said, Hey, Abraham, you're finally going to have a son. Woo! What did Abraham do? <laughs> have you checked my age, God? Yeah, you're 99. Have you checked Sarah's age? Yeah, she's 89. Say it again. You're going to have a son. Come tell Sarah. Sarah, you're going to have a baby. <laughs> Why'd you laugh? I didn't laugh. Read your Bible. Wouldn't you laugh? You know, you go up here to one of the local hospitals, see an old guy walking around. What are you doing here, old timer? Wife can have a baby. You got a young wife? Yeah, kid's only 90. But when the New Testament writes it, God can't remember the failure. We can read it. God can't record it. Abraham believed God. Sarah believed God. Look how many times Moses blew it. And yet the New Testament, Moses was faithful in all of his house. We can read the failures, but the Holy Spirit can't record the failures. They're under the blood of Christ. Aren't you glad your past is under the blood of Christ tonight?
Don't let the enemy beat you up with your past. You can't change it. It's gone. It's buried. It's forgiven. It's forgotten. I've had people say, well, I can't forgive myself. And I'll say the same thing. I didn't know you were holier than God. God forgives and God forgets. I, I got four minutes left. Randy, did you have something? That, that's prior to Calvary. Prior to Calvary. You've got to put it in chronological order. Remember, the Bible's a progressive revelation of God. So he gives a truth and he adds truth on top of that to explain it. So you've got to go to the rest of it. The, the letters are given to tell you how to apply the words of Jesus to your life. Now, don't forget, Paul is not writing as a theologian. He's writing as a pastor trying to correct problems in the churches. Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, uh, uh, he's, he's writing to correct problems in the churches and to tell them, how do you live now? Based, and he actually says this, healthy teaching, and, and, and this is what he tells Timothy, literally, healthy teaching gets back to the words of Jesus. So what the, what the letters are saying are all built on the words of Jesus, but amplifying and interpreting for us in our day-by-day -day living. How do I apply that to my life when I don't want to put forth love? You know, some people have the idea everything happens... And automatically, I just want to read one passage in closing from, say, yeah, it's actually from First Peter. And I'm sorry, Second Peter, I think is what I want to read. Let me turn over here. Yeah, I'll go over in Second Peter. Again, we have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. When we're saved, we start manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. However, notice what Peter says. Uh, starting with verse 3, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the epinosis, personal intimate relationship knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Uh, he goes on to say, <laughs> I'm sorry, through the epinosis of him that has called us by means of his own glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be sharers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. And beside this, give all diligence, and he uses the word for a choir director here, the technical term for a choir director, how the same way Pastor Nicole directs the altos and the tenors and the sopranos on Sunday morning when she's directing the choir and the instruments, you come in now, you come in now, you come in now, okay? Add... Uh, so I'm going to translate it that way. The King James just says add, but choreograph to your faith virtue. Now virtue, we, we don't have an English word. It means to fulfill the purpose for which you exist. The virtue of the chair you're sitting in is to hold your weight. Okay, the virtue of this microphone is to amplify my voice. So he says add to your faith the purpose for which God created you. What's the purpose? To know him. And have a relationship with him. And manifest the fruit of the spirit. All right. Add to blend your faith. And then to virtue knowledge. And to knowledge self control. And to self control endurance. And to endurance brotherly love. And to brotherly love agape love. So it's a process of blending these things into your life. Day by day. And year by year. As we grow in Jesus Christ. So it's up to us to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And that's what Ephesians 6, uh, I'm sorry, Romans 6 says, know that you're dead to sin. Secondly, it says, reckon you're dead to sin. That's open the page mark, sin, write down, I'm dead. And thirdly, yield to the Holy Spirit. So we can live by the power of the Holy Spirit as we allow these things to blend into our life. As we work at being the kind of people God wants us to be. How do we work at it? Hiding his word in our heart. He shows us how he wants us to live. And then he deals with us by the Holy Spirit to manifest the nature of Jesus Christ. The apostles are called Christians at Antioch because they saw Jesus Christ in our life. And the best of what I preached on Easter Sunday at Grandview was the best witness to the resurrection is you. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're the best, you're the best witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Let's give the Lord a hand for his grace and then we'll quit here in a minute. Father, we're so thankful for your love and your amazing grace to us, that you love each person here as if they're the only ones you ever had to love. And I pray that if there's anyone here tonight that doesn't know your son, 
I pray you'll draw them by the power of your Holy Spirit in the closing moments of this service. I wonder as every head's bowed, every eye closed, do you know Jesus? I'm not asking you want to join this church. We're not the way to heaven. But the Bible says, as many as receive him, he gives power to become the children of God. The Bible says, he that has the Son has life, and he that doesn't have the Son does not have life. And if Jesus Christ is living in your life, you know it. The Bible says we know we've passed from death unto life. Galatians says he's given us of his spirit. And Romans says the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. We're children of God. As every head is bowed, maybe you're here to say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. I need Jesus Christ in my life. Pray for me. Just slip your hand up and down. Always give an invitation no matter where I preach in the world. Always give an invitation. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please. And if you need Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask Randy and Elizabeth to come. And if you need Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you to do what I did when I was 19 years old, baptized church member, didn't know Jesus. I stepped out of my seat that night. A man led me in a prayer, and Jesus Christ changed my life. So if you need Jesus Christ, I'm just going to ask you to come up and let them pray with you again. You will not be joining this church. It's got nothing to do with church membership. It's relationship. It's not what you know. It's who you know. All right? So I'm going to ask each of you to turn to the person on each side of you and just say, if you want to go down and receive the Lord, I'll go with you. Go ahead. That's how I got saved when I was 19. I want to go down and receive the Lord, I'll go with you. Always give opportunity. Always give opportunity. Okay, God bless you. Bring somebody with you Sunday. Believe God to speak to hearts. And hug a whole bunch of folks on the way out. Let them know God loves them.